The first season of Ahsoka is over. I collected over 200 Star Wars Easter eggs, references, mythological connections, and other interesting facts as the episodes released, so here is a compilation of all of them. The series premiere, Master and Apprentice, is the first on-screen Star Wars story to have a crawl at the start since The Rise of Skywalker. That's not subtle or anything, but I love that it even has four ellipses at the end instead of three, like every other Star Wars crawl. Except for Return of the Jedi for some reason. Why do you have to be different, Episode Six? The Republic ship Balin and Shin travel around in is an Ada-class shuttle first seen in the Clone Wars episode Grievous Intrigue. It was more commonly referred to as a Jedi Ambassador shuttle, which goes along with the villain's initial claim that they are Jedi. On the New Republic ship, we can see the blue security uniforms that were prominent in The Mandalorian, but also the brown and blue officer uniforms first seen in Return of the Jedi. As Ahsoka enters the ruins on the planet Arcana, she throws her lightsabers into the floor and spins them in a circle. She uses that exact same move during a fight with her clone troopers during Order 66 in the Clone Wars. In the ruins, she discovers a map to Thrawn's location locked away by the Night Sisters of Dathomir. It's similar to Cal Kestis finding another spherical device called the Astrium on Dathomir itself. Outside of the ruins, Ahsoka is confronted by several HK-87 assassin droids. That specific model first appeared in The Mandalorian Season 2, but the HK assassin line was first created for the Knights of the Old Republic character HK-47. Ahsoka is rescued from an explosion by Hu Yang, an old Jedi droid that helped younglings construct their first lightsabers in the Clone Wars series. He continues to be voiced by David Tennant. The New Republic contacts Ahsoka, who has the call sign Fulcrum. That was her code name as a rebel agent in Star Wars Rebels, which she first used in the novel Ahsoka by E.K. Johnston. She and Hu Yang travel the galaxy in a T-6 shuttle. It was also referred to as simply a Jedi shuttle, and was first seen in the Clone Wars episode Children of the Force. Ahsoka lands on Home 1, the rebel flagship that was first seen in Return of the Jedi as the command ship of Admiral Akbar. It now serves the New Republic. On board, we can see several green-marked X-Wings, which I assume would make up Green Squadron, which was led by Hera Syndulla in Star Wars Rebels. Speaking of Hera, this episode marks her first live-action appearance. She was one of the main characters of Star Wars Rebels, and we see her rise from the leader of a small rebel cell to a full-fledged general in the Rebel Alliance. We can also hear her name over the intercom in Yavin 4 and Rogue One, and see her ship, the Ghost, at the battles of Scarif and Exegol. She, Ahsoka, and Hu Yang meet in Home One's briefing room, which was where we saw Mon Mothma, Admiral Akbar, and Crix Medine lay out the plan for the Battle of Endor in Return of the Jedi. Hera claims Grand Admiral Thrawn was killed in the Battle of Lothal. That battle is central to the series finale of Star Wars Rebels, where we saw Jedi in training Ezra Bridger summon several Pergil to attack Thrawn's fleet and teleport him to some unknown location. We learn in this episode that it's a completely different galaxy. Later, we see Lothal's capital city, which was a prominent location throughout Star Wars Rebels as Ezra Bridger's homeworld. Thanks to his actions exiling himself and Thrawn, the planet is liberated and the anniversary of that battle is being celebrated in the episode. Governor of Lothal, Ryder Azadi, leads the celebration. He was a fugitive of the Empire in Rebels and allied himself with Ezra and the rest of the crew of the Ghost to liberate Lothal. He is played by Clancy Brown, who voiced the character in Star Wars Rebels. He also played Berg, the Deveronian in the Mandalorian episode The Prisoner, and he voiced Savage Press in The Clone Wars and an Inquisitor in Tales of the Jedi. With Sabine missing from the celebration, Ryder asks Senator Jai Kel to give an impromptu speech. He was another Rebels character that we first met in an Imperial Academy training to become a Stormtrooper. Ezra was undercover there and learned Kel was Force-sensitive, which made him a target for the Empire. He helped Jai go into hiding with his family, but years later Kel re-emerged to help Ryder liberate the planet. The monument for the Battle of Lothal features all the main cast of characters from Star Wars Rebels and was first seen in the epilogue for the series. It was painted by Sabine. As she heads away from Capital City on a speeder bike, she is chased by two pilots in E-Wings. Those starfighters were first created for the Dark Empire comic series as a New Republic ship, so it's fitting to see them pop up again here. The pilots use Spectre call signs, which were also used by the crew of the Ghost while they were a small rebel cell on Lothal. The astromech droid in one of the pilot's ships is modeled after the original Kenner R2-D2 action figure. Sabine makes her home in an old communications tower, which is also where Ezra lived as an orphan before joining the crew of the Ghost. Inside, you can see Sabine's signature art style painted all over the walls. That's a habit she formed in the Ghost, where she decorated her bunk and even the bunks of her friends with colorful art pieces. You can see a painted scout trooper helmet that was often worn by Ezra throughout Star Wars Rebels. You can also see several unpainted helmets, because when he was younger, Ezra enjoyed stealing and collecting every kind of Imperial helmet he could get his hands on. Sabine has a loath cat named Merle as a companion. Those creatures were seen all over Lothal in Star Wars Rebels and often helped the crew of the Ghost in their missions, sometimes inadvertently and sometimes more mystically. 
Inside a box of assorted items, you can see the airbrush Sabine used throughout Star Wars Rebels, there's a hair clip that once belonged to her mother, Ursa Wren, and a patch with Sabine's variant of the Phoenix Crest that helped inspire the official Rebel Alliance and eventually New Republic insignia. Sabine watches a recording Ezra made for her just before he went missing. It's similar to the one we actually get to see in Star Wars Rebels that plays after his disappearance, but he makes it clear this new recording is different and for Sabine's eyes only to avoid confusion. Back on Arcana, we confirm that Morgan Elsbeth was a Night Sister. The Night Sisters of Dathomir were witches that harnessed the dark side of the Force through magic. They were first created for the book The Courtship of Princess Leia and were later brought into the Clone Wars. The ruins Ahsoka saw earlier have faint remains of red paint on them, and the robes and headpieces look similar to the leader of the Night Sisters in the Clone Wars, Mother Talzin, and of course, the Great Mothers. We will obviously be talking about them more later. The planet Arcana is new to Star Wars, but the definition of the word is fitting, meaning deep secret or mystery. In Dungeons & Dragons, Arcana is connected to lore about spells, magic items, and so on. Here, we can more clearly see that Shin has a Padawan braid, cementing her position as a Padawan of sorts to Balin, but also showing that he seems to be holding on to at least some of the traditions of the Jedi Order to which he once belonged. The shot of Ahsoka's shuttle flanked by X-Wings as they fly over Lothal is directly lifted from the epilogue of Star Wars Rebels. Sabine comments that it's good to see Hu Yang in One Piece, which I imagine is a reference to his appearances in The Clone Wars, where he is dismantled by pirates and then slowly reconstructed by Jedi younglings. He proudly claims to be 75% original parts, which isn't an easter egg, but it is impressive because he is about 25,000 years old. He was built shortly after the founding of the Jedi Order. In The Clone Wars, he shows younglings his catalog of every lightsaber that he helped build for the Jedi Order. He uses that database to find the identity of Balin Skull using his lightsaber. Shin's probe droid spying on Sabine and then reporting back to its Dark Master is very similar to Darth Maul's hunt for Queen Amidala on Tatooine in The Phantom Menace. Sabine wields Ezra's lightsaber against Shin, which he left behind before confronting Grand Admiral Thrawn and sending them both into exile. Sabine is stabbed in the duel and in Part 2, Toil and Trouble, she wakes up in a hospital being tended to by a 2-1-B medical droid. That model was first seen taking care of Luke after the Wampa attack in The Empire Strikes Back. On the planet Setos, we see Morgan Elsbeth arrive flanked by the same kind of soldiers we saw guarding her on the planet Corvus in The Mandalorian Season 2. She activates a star map to find Thrawn's location, and it is very similar to other ancient star maps we've seen in Star Wars before, specifically in the video game Knights of the Old Republic. Thrawn's location is circled by some crude depictions of Pergil, the creatures that took Thrawn and Ezra to this other galaxy at the end of Star Wars Rebels. Cetos is likely named after Cetus, which was a term for any huge sea monster in Greek mythology. Considering the prevalence of star whales at this planet, it is an appropriate name. Ahsoka and Hera travel to Corellia to investigate Morgan's old factories. That planet is well known as a producer of starships as far back as A New Hope. It was the homeworld of Han Solo as seen in Solo, A Star Wars Story. Back then, we could see it falling into pollution and decay under the Galactic Empire. It seems to have recovered a bit since the New Republic took over. The same could be seen on Lothal, which suffered heavily under the Empire, but is now clean and beautiful once again. Back in the hospital, Hu Yang notes the modification Sabine made to Ezra's lightsaber. She added prongs to the emitter, which might make it safer for her to wield with her lack of ability in the Force, but it also lines up with the fact that she would paint and modify her friend's gear all the time in Star Wars Rebels, often without their permission. The Corellian businessman Min Weaver explains how they are dismantling Imperial ships to repurpose them for the New Republic fleet. This is exactly how the New Republic capital ship the Starhawk was created in the Aftermath trilogy of books, and we can witness their construction firsthand in the game Star Wars Squadrons. The necessity of using ex-Imperials in key positions of the New Republic is consistent with books that take place in the New Republic era like the Alphabet Squadron trilogy by Alexander Freed and Last Shot by Daniel Jose Older. Weaver lists off several droid types that work in his facility. One of them, the IW-37, was a loader droid first seen in Revenge of the Sith. Weaver shows off a hyperdrive that was taken from an Imperial SSD or Super Star Destroyer like the Executor from The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. As the hyperdrive is stolen, Hera gives chase in her shuttle, the Phantom II. The Ghost's original shuttle, the Phantom, was lost during a mission to steal Y-Wings from an Imperial salvage yard. It was replaced by the Phantom II, a Sheathapede class transport. That kind of ship was used by the Trade Federation in the prequel films The Clone Wars and beyond. Hera's astromech, Chopper, assists Hera during the chase. He was a veteran of the Clone Wars and has been at Hera's side since she repaired him as a young girl. He can be briefly seen rolling through the background of Rogue One on Yavin 4 and is voiced by Dave Filoni. 
Meanwhile, Ahsoka confronts Marok, who is never referred to as an Inquisitor, but StarWars.com has already confirmed that he was once part of the Inquisitorius. His armor and double-bladed lightsaber match the aesthetic of his former peers. The police gunships on Corellia are the same model that have been seen throughout the Clone Wars, Reign of the Empire, and New Republic. They're old models, but I guess they still get the job done. Back on Lothal, Sabine takes her Mandalorian armor back out and cuts her hair. The way she cuts her hair mirrors a character from Rebels named Kanan, who goes through the same ritual before a mission to rescue Hera. We'll come back to him later as well. The scene where Sabine and Ahsoka reunite in front of the Battle of Lothal Monument is a near shot-for-shot -shot recreation of the final scene from Star Wars Rebels. There are some changes, most obviously the color of Ahsoka's cloak, but we see why those changes were made over the course of the series. The stolen hyperdrive is traced to the Danab system where Setos is located. That's a pretty obscure location in Star Wars, only appearing in the Legends Essential Atlas reference book. The Eye of Scion is a giant hyperdrive ring. In Attack of the Clones and the Clone Wars, they were used to transport much smaller ships that had no hyperdrive through hyperspace. In Part 3, Time to Fly, Ahsoka gives Sabine a helmet so she can't see while she trains with her saber, similar to what Obi-Wan does with Luke in A New Hope. Sabine even says something close to Luke's line from that scene, I can't see, how am I supposed to fight? Ahsoka calls the technique Zatochi, which is named for Zatuichi, a fictional Japanese samurai character who is blind. Zatuichi also served as inspiration for Chiridimwi in Rogue One. Hera meets with several senators and Chancellor Mon Mothma. Of course, she was the leader of the Rebel Alliance, as seen in Return of the Jedi and Rogue One, and she has most recently been one of the stars of Andor. At her side is Hamato Ziono. He is the senator of Hosnian Prime, the planet that we see destroyed by Starkiller Base in The Force Awakens. He's also the father of Kazuta Ziono, the main character of the animated series Star Wars Resistance. He seems to be serving a similar role as Senator Borsk Falia, a Bothan New Republic leader from the original Thrawn trilogy of books in Star Wars Legends. Hera says she encountered Imperial Loyalists at the Santhi shipyards. That's the same location where Han Solo got his speeder stuck while trying to escape the White Worm Gang in Solo. Hera also says Thrawn killed friends, people who were like family to her. She might be referring to Kanan there. Thrawn didn't kill Kanan personally, that would be Governor Price's doing, but still. She worked under Thrawn, so maybe Hera holds him accountable. More directly, Thrawn killed several members of her rebel cell at the Battle of Adalon, including Commander Sato. After the meeting with the Senators, Hera sees her son, Jason. He was first introduced in the epilogue of Star Wars Rebels and is Kanan's son. The boy can be seen wearing the same pauldron Kanan wore in Rebels. Hu Yang reminds Ahsoka there have been very few Mandalorian Jedi. Tar Vizsla is the only one we know of for sure, the creator of the Darksaber that was so important in Seasons 2 and 3 of The Mandalorian. I guess you could count Grogu as a Mandalorian Jedi as well if you want. Hu Yang also says Ahsoka comes from a long line of non-traditional Jedi. He's referring to her master, Anakin Skywalker, who was trained by Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was trained by Qui-Gon Jinn, who was trained by Dooku. Obi-Wan was a pretty traditional Jedi, but the others? Yeah, they fit that description. Shin's starfighter looks similar to the Fireball, which was Kazuta Ziono's primary starfighter in Star Wars Resistance. She wears a headset that looks identical to the ones worn by Anakin and Obi-Wan at the start of Revenge of the Sith. While under fire from enemy squadrons, Hu Yang yells, This is intolerable! That's a line he shares with Henry Jones Sr. in Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. Ahsoka going out into space to face the Starfighters felt like something you would see in the Clone Wars series. Plo Koon did something similar to defend his clone troopers, and Ahsoka fought in space herself on at least one occasion. Near the end of the episode, we see our first live-action Pergil up close. In Part 4, Fallen Jedi, Ahsoka refers to Thrawn as heir to the Empire. That was the title of the very first book by Timothy Zahn that introduced the character. Ahsoka tells Sabine that sometimes they have to do what's right regardless of their personal feelings. That's not an exact quote from Anakin, but it's very similar to something he says to Padme in Attack of the Clones. Ahsoka using the Force to hold an enemy in the line of friendly fire is like something straight out of the Star Wars Jedi games. You can see the ghost in earlier episodes, but this is easily the best live-action look we've gotten of Hera's ship so far. It's a VCX-100, the same type of ship Han claims to have while he's playing Sabacc against Lando in Solo A Star Wars Story. You can see a very small photograph of Kanan Jarrus on the dash of the ghost. Carson Teva returns in this episode and seems like he could easily become a common factor in all these New Republic era stories, having also appeared in The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett. The pilot Lieutenant Lander is played by Brendan Wayne. He's the actor who's usually wearing Din Djarin's armor in The Mandalorian, so it's great to see his face on screen. Carson refers to Hera as Phoenix Leader. In Star Wars Rebels, she and her rebel cell joined up with Phoenix Group, and she became the head of their starfighter squadron. Ahsoka calmly preparing to strike against Marok and then timing it through the spinning blades reminds me of how Obi-Wan defeated Maul in Star Wars Rebels. 
Marok's disintegration after his death is awfully similar to what happened to an Inquisitor Ahsoka faced in the Tales of the Jedi animated series. It also reminds me of the way Night Sister magic leaks out of Savage Opress during his death. It's not quite the same, but I think it's possible Marok could have been enhanced or maybe even reanimated by one of Morgan's spells. The runes behind Ahsoka in the map are difficult to make out, but I know the final word is occlusion. I think it says something of occlusion, but I can only make out a handful of runes in the first word. The only thing I can think of that this could refer to is the occlusion zone from the High Republic, which is an area of space that the leader of the villainous Nile carved out for himself in the Outer Rim. He set up devices that prevented hyperspace travel into the occlusion zone, keeping the Republic and the Jedi away. Ahsoka's duel with Balin also reminds me of Obi-Wan's final duel with Maul, the way they shift stances around to keep their opponent guessing before striking. Balin's slower but terrifyingly heavy strikes are reminiscent of the crossguard stance in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I don't think that's an intentional reference or anything, it's just what I thought of when I saw him fighting. Sabine uses her Mandalorian wrist rockets to throw Shin off balance instead of the Force. This is just like in Star Wars Rebels, where she used her Mandalorian Vam braces to mimic the Force in various ways while she trained with the Darksaber. Balin mentions Sabine's family dying on Mandalore. In Star Wars Rebels, Sabine helps start the Mandalorian uprising that leads to the Great Purge of Mandalore that we have heard mentioned several times in The Mandalorian and briefly saw in the Book of Boba Fett. Her family included her mother, Ursa, father, Aldric, and brother, Tristan. The build-up to the Eye of Scion's jump to hyperspace is especially tense after seeing the damage a hyperspace collision can do in The Last Jedi. The realm Ahsoka finds herself in at the end of the episode is called The World Between Worlds. It first appeared in Star Wars Rebels, and that was Ahsoka's first trip there. It exists outside of time and space. In Rebels, Ezra was basically able to reach into the past to save Ahsoka from death at the hands of Darth Vader. The character at the end of the episode is named Anakin Skywalker, and he's kind of a big deal. I'm joking, obviously, but how great was it to see Hayden Christensen in the role for the second time in just over a year? This was many fans' first time seeing him interacting with Ahsoka on screen, and hopefully it'll serve as a gateway for them to check out The Clone Wars. In Part 5, Shadow Warrior, Ahsoka and Anakin's opening banter felt very similar to the way they would talk to one another in the Clone Wars series. If you never saw Ahsoka's animated origins, Anakin calls her Snips specifically because she was very snippy with him upon their first meeting. Ahsoka tells Anakin she won't fight him, and he retorts that he's heard that before. He heard it from Luke, who kept insisting he wouldn't fight his father in Return of the Jedi. The way Anakin fights feels like Hayden Christensen hasn't missed a beat since 2005 in Revenge of the Sith. His fighting style is exactly the same. Carson Teva says Senator Organa can only cover for Hera for so long. He's of course referring to Leia, who would still be the senator of the Alderaan sector in the New Republic. That sector had more planets than just Alderaan, to be clear. Jason helps his mother open up to the Force a bit until she can hear lightsabers clashing amidst the waves of Setos. We've seen Hera sensing things through the Force in Star Wars Rebels as well, specifically Kanan for a time after he died. Anakin knocks Ahsoka further back into her memories during one of their first missions together as Master and Apprentice. I think the purple tint suggests it might be the Battle of Teth seen in the Clone Wars movie. There we can see Phase 1 clone troopers in the 501st, noted by the blue markings on their armor. ATTEs are seen through the fog as well as LAATs. Ahsoka wields one green lightsaber at this point in the timeline. Anakin is seen wearing the Jedi armor and the shorter hairstyle seen in the Clone Wars. I would say Hayden does a great job at channeling some of Matt Lanter's take on the character as well. We can see Twi'leks in the background of some later shots, so I would assume the scene transitions to a mission on the planet Ryloth. Ahsoka laments that several clones died thanks to orders she gave, something else she had to grapple with on more than one occasion in the Clone Wars, but specifically in an arc that takes place on Ryloth. Rex can be seen in his Phase 1 armor, the clone Ahsoka grew closest with during the conflict. Ahsoka struggles with the idea that she and the Jedi are just warriors at this point. It's the same thing Cal Kestis is working through in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. So many Padawans never got to experience the Jedi Order outside of war. We also see Ahsoka during the Siege of Mandalore, a specific event that takes place in Season 7 of The Clone Wars. There, she and her clone troopers battled against Mandalorians under the leadership of Maul, which is why some of their helmets have horns on them with a red and black color scheme. Her clones are seen with orange paint on their helmets that match her own facial markings. They are members of the 332nd Company. Rex is seen again, this time in his Phase 2 armor. Her two lightsabers are blue now, thanks to Anakin's tinkering with them. During the final bit of their fight, Anakin has the yellow and red eyes of someone immersed in the dark side. She never got to see him like this, but she has seen his eyes that color when she faced Darth Vader on Malachor. Ahsoka throwing the lightsaber away is in the same spirit of Luke doing the same thing in Return of the Jedi, choosing forgiveness and progress over death. 
The water rising up to swallow Ahsoka reminds me of a trading card that Dave Filoni created the art for, which showed her waist-deep in water during her escape from Malachor. Jason asks if Hu Yang knows how to build a lightsaber, which was his primary job in the Clone Wars, teaching younglings to build their first weapons. In this episode, Ahsoka begins wearing the white robes we first saw in the epilogue of Star Wars Rebels. Her plan to get help from the Pergil is straight out of Ezra's playbook. Jason even mentions the stories his mother told him about how the Pergil saved Lothal in the Star Wars Rebels finale. There's an Ishi Tib crewman on the New Republic ship, an alien first created for Return of the Jedi. I mostly wanted to bring him up just because I think the prosthetic looks great. The Pergil glowing before jumping to hyperspace is exactly how they appear when they jump in Star Wars Rebels. In Part 6, Far Far Away, as Ahsoka travels from one galaxy to another, Hu Yang mentions the stories he used to tell younglings at the Jedi Temple. History of the Galaxy Parts 1, 2, and 3. Ahsoka insists that Part 1 is the best, and because it's set up as a trilogy, I think this is likely all a joke about the three Star Wars trilogies and Star Wars fans tending to passionately pick and defend their own favorites. The link to the trilogies is reinforced when Hu Yang later begins one of his old stories with A Long Time Ago and A Galaxy Far, Far Away, the same text that opens every Star Wars movie that was originally inspired by the fairy tale opening Once Upon a Time. Morgan Elsbeth claims her people, the ancient Dathomiri, were the first to harness and ride Pergil. I can buy that because they were also known to ride rancors on Dathomir, which is just love riding big ol' creatures, I guess. On the planet Peridia, the villains take Sabine to a tower. It definitely seems like it has some Tolkien-esque inspiration, looking like a mix between Orthanc and Minas Tirith. That wouldn't surprise me if it were intentional given the series' other thematic connections to Middle-earth. At the top of the tower, we meet three actual Dathomirian Night Sisters. They are closer in appearance to how we saw them in the Clone Wars series, with more vibrant red robes and white skin with black tattoos. The Great Mothers look a lot like Mother Talzin. They seem to be inspired by Greek mythology and two sets of three mystical figures. First is the Grey Eye, also known as the Grey Sisters. They helped Perseus learn to destroy Medusa. But they also share some stronger similarities with the fates of Greek mythology, three sisters who were also interestingly called the Moirai, which is awfully close to the name of Ahsoka's spirit companion, Morai the Convor. The fates spun the story of humanity into a loom, with each thread representing one person's life. The Night Sister Mothers speak of loose threads a couple of times. The names of the fates were Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. In the credits, the Great Mothers are listed as Clothau, Lachesis, and Atropa, all nearly identical to their Greek counterparts. It makes sense that the Witches of Dathomir would have origins outside of the main galaxy, since their understanding and connection to the Force is so different when compared to that of the Jedi or many other cultures we've experienced. The Chimera makes its first live-action appearance as the Star Destroyer of Grand Admiral Thrawn. It's got an artistic rendering of its namesake on its ventral side and has been Thrawn's flagship since he was introduced back in Heir to the Empire. And who better to explain its mythological importance than the book's author, Timothy Zahn? He said, In Greek myth, the Chimera was a fantastical, fire-breathing beast that combined lion, goat, and snake. It was also held to be unconquerable, though it was eventually killed by Bellerophon. Nowadays, the word refers to something made up of disparate parts or something wildly and grotesquely imaginary. All of those elements went into my decision to name Thrawn's flagship the Chimera. Disparate elements, human plus Chiss, considered imaginary and hence not taken seriously by others until Thrawn was ready to move, and unconquerable. The ship was an Imperial One-Class Star Destroyer. It kinda looks like a Two-Class in its introduction, but Cory's datapad and Deckard's ladder pointed out that the conning tower is simply broken, making it appear more like an Imperial Two-Class. The damage was all done by Pergil at the end of Star Wars Rebels, when the Space Whales smashed into Thrawn's fleet, attached themselves to his Star Destroyer in a less than gentle fashion, and then flew off to Peridia. The army of Thrawn Stormtroopers, or Night Troopers, is rebuilt in a similar manner as Kylo Ren's helmet in The Rise of Skywalker. Both designs were inspired by the Japanese art of Kintsugi, involving the reforging of something broken using gold lacquer. Enoch, the captain of Thrawn's guard, is seen wearing a distinct helmet with a golden face inlaid in what appears to be a tank trooper helmet or something similar. The gold face is reminiscent of the Mask of Agamemnon, a Greek artifact said to be a funeral mask. Enoch also shares a name with a biblical character from the Book of Genesis who lived 365 years before he was taken into heaven alive by God himself. I think in the future of Star Wars it's possible he could serve a similar role as Rook, Thrawn's bodyguard in Star Wars Legends that appeared and died in Star Wars Rebels, so the character would need to be replaced in this new version of the story. 
Then of course there is the Grand Admiral himself, who I already mentioned is first appearing in the Legends book, Heir to the Empire. He is a Chiss and one of the few high-ranking non-humans that existed in the Empire. He is played by Lars Mikkelsen, who also voiced the character in Star Wars Rebels. He is accompanied by a musical theme played on an organ, which was first orchestrated by Kevin Kiner for Star Wars Rebels as well, and it is so cool to hear it again. Thrawn agrees to load up Night Sister cargo from the catacombs. The boxes look like they could be caskets of some kind. I wonder if they're dead Night Sister bodies that are just itching to become undead Night Sister bodies like we've seen in the Clone Wars and Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. The Grand Admiral's willingness to ally himself with the Night Sisters makes a lot of sense given his previous defeats. Both times he was foiled by mystical creatures connected to the Force, a power he had little understanding of. If there was a chance for him to learn more about some aspect of the Force in the past ten years, he surely would have taken it to remove that blind spot. Thrawn says Sabine Wren is a familiar name to him. He specifically studied her art to hunt down a rebel spy within his midst in Star Wars Rebels. The Dathomiri Tower has some script on the outside walls that matches similar writing first seen in Zepho tombs in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. The writing above the temple door also reads, Praise Kujet, ruler of all, may his reign last for all, and then it probably ends with time or eternity. Kujet was a Zepho sage who made his palace and tomb on Dathomir, having a direct relationship with the Night Sisters there. The Howler Sabine Rides isn't anything pre-existing from Star Wars as far as I know, but it fits in well with the rest of this episode's high fantasy vibe. It seems like something straight out of the never-ending story or Dark Crystal, or the Wargs from Lord of the Rings. Same with the little crab people, the Noti, but they also remind me of some of the weirder episodes of the Clone Wars, like when R2 and 3PO discover the odd little Petiteets. Their village also reminds me of the Lerman village from the Clone Wars episode Jedi Crash. Their outfits remind me of Hobbit clothing from Lord of the Rings, and their ability to disguise themselves as rocks is similar to how Frodo and Sam hide from Sauron's forces using their elvish cloaks in the Two Towers. Balin refers to Ezra as a Boken Jedi. In the real world, a Boken is a Japanese wooden sword used for training, similar to what Ahsoka and Sabine used in the Jedi Shuttle back in Part 3. I wonder if this term could be used somewhat dismissively by Balin, as if the wooden sword is a cheap imitation of a lightsaber. Maybe he considers Jedi who are, quote, trained in the wild as lesser than those trained by the Order at the Temple. This character is named Jabba the Hutt if you're a Star Wars Rebels fan. If you're not, Ezra Bridger's appearance marks the first time we've seen the character in over five years since he first went missing with Thrawn in the Rebels finale. The scars on his cheek are from a duel with the Grand Inquisitor way back in Star Wars Rebels Season 1. His opening line, I knew I could count on you, matches one of the last things he said to Sabine, that he's counting on her to see his mission through. One of his final lines in a hologram to his Rebels family said that he couldn't wait to come home, a sentiment he reiterates to Sabine in this episode. Thrawn requesting the entire history of Ahsoka Tano is very much in line with his personality. He learns everything he can about his military targets and exploits any given weakness. Part 7, Dreams and Madness, begins on Coruscant at a Senate building. You can see the seal of the Galactic Senate on its front with the New Republic insignia in blue underneath. Ziono calls Hera a member of the New Republic Security Force, a branch of the government first established in 1994, appearing in legend stories like The Courtship of Princess Leia and X-Wing The Krytos Trap. I assume that since this is a military hearing, Admiral Akbar is seated right next to the annoying senator. And of course, C-3PO makes his most prominent appearance since The Rise of Skywalker. Hera met him back in one of the earliest episodes of Star Wars Rebels. It makes sense that Leia would want to help Hera because they also met in the second season of the series. It's stated that Leia is the leader of the Defense Council, a part of the New Republic Senate that was first created in 1996 for the Black Fleet Crisis books. The holographic recording of Anakin mentions the possible enemies Ahsoka might face in the Clone Wars. I expect just about everyone watching this series knows General Grievous and Count Dooku from the prequel films, but Asajj Ventress is criminally lesser known. She was a major villain in both the Clone Wars animated series and the Now Legends micro-series. She was a Dathomirian that became the Sith apprentice to Dooku for a time until she was betrayed and returned home to the Night Sisters. Much of Anakin's recording is taken from an episode of Tales of the Jedi where Anakin trains Ahsoka to defend herself by having clone troopers try to stun her. The exercises wound up being valuable when she had to fight those same clones to survive Order 66. The recording is also similar to one we see Ahsoka watching in Star Wars Rebels. She does mention that he made 20 different recordings, so now I guess we've seen two of them. He encourages Ahsoka to practice her lightsaber forms more often than he did. Obi-Wan also chides Anakin for not practicing his forms more in Attack of the Clones. The Pergil reach Peridia in the middle of an Imperial minefield. They appear to be seeker mines that chase after any object that flies near them. A similar weapon can be used in the video game Star Wars Squadrons. 
Ahsoka's desperate flight into the Ring of Pergil Bones is a direct parallel to Han flying into the asteroid field in The Empire Strikes Back, but this time it's to show Thrawn's unwillingness to casually throw away the lives of his pilots. Morgan Elsbeth gives Thrawn a collection of information that the Inquisitorial database had on Ahsoka. That would be data gathered by the Inquisitors, like we've seen in Star Wars Rebels, Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Star Wars Jedi games, several books, and even Ahsoka with Marok. Thrawn realizes the threat Ahsoka faces when he learns that her master was Anakin Skywalker. He met Anakin back during the Clone Wars when he was still part of the Chiss Ascendancy. They shared a mission together and later worked as partners within the Empire after Anakin became Darth Vader and Thrawn joined the Imperial Navy. He was able to deduce the true identity of the Sith Lord. Sabine catches Ezra up on galactic history. She says the war ended at the Battle of Endor, which technically it ends with the Battle of Jakku, but I can see why Sabine or others would consider Endor the true victory. It was a more heroic moment for the Rebellion and probably sounds better in the history hollows, seeing the destruction of another Death Star as well as the death of the Emperor. Or at least supposed death, because Sabine admits that's just what people say. She wasn't there, she has no first-hand knowledge, but really I think this is a joke about how Palpatine is still out there somewhere. Zeb gets his first name drop of the series, which is great. We've seen him already in Sabine's mural on Lothal, and we also saw him as a friend of Carson Teva's in The Mandalorian Season 3. Ezra mentions Sabine's previous training that he witnessed in Star Wars Rebels, specifically where he was part of her lessons learning to wield the Darksaber. Ahsoka and Sabine communicating through the Force is, of course, exactly like what we've seen Jedi and Force users do before, like when Luke called out to Leia on Cloud City. Balin sending Shin off on her own, claiming his path lies in another direction, is reminiscent of Obi-Wan leaving Luke on the Death Star to face Vader, even down to the similar lines. The nomads chasing the Nodi caravan reminds me of the warg chases in the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies, which obviously isn't a Star Wars reference, but Filoni has filled this series with Tolkien inspiration. The Nodi using a slingshot against a nomad, even though it was hilariously ineffective, could be a callback to Ezra's weapon as a child being an energy slingshot. Maybe he taught the Nodi to make and shoot them. Their use of other improvised weapons reminds me of even more Tolkien stuff. I already compared them to hobbits, but using rocks as weapons is like Merry and Pippin fighting the Urukai, and using a frying pan is a very Samwise Gamgee move. I'll occasionally point out things that connect to future Star Wars content, pre-Easter eggs or pre easter eggs for funsies. Ezra using a mixture of the Force and martial arts to defend the Nodi reminded me of the amazing footage that was shown for the Acolyte at Star Wars Celebration. That fight choreography looked sick. Ezra using the Force to stop Shin's lightsaber blade has popped up several times in other stories, but probably most prominently in The Rise of Skywalker. I don't think this is an intentional reference, but I think Grand Admiral Thrawn would have loved playing Hollow Tactics in Pylon Saloon in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Ezra's hilarious attempts to talk himself out of getting killed is very consistent with his portrayal in Star Wars Rebels, constantly quipping even in the face of capture or death. In the season finale, The Jedi, The Witch, and The Warlord, the title itself is a reference to the first book in the fantasy series The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Thrawn vows to never again be thwarted by the heroics of a single Jedi. I actually feel like this could refer to multiple events from Star Wars Rebels. Kanan turned the tide of the Battle of Adalon by bringing the Bindu into the fight, and of course Ezra exiled Thrawn using the Pergil in the Battle of Lothal. The ritual the Great Mothers perform on Morgan Elsbeth, the Gift of Shadows, is word for word the same as the ritual seen performed on Asajj Ventress in the Clone Wars. Hers seemed a lot more intense, with more magic, but she didn't get the burns on her face, so it's a little different. The Blade of Talzin is a green-flamed sword wielded by Mother Talzin in the Clone Wars. She used it to duel Mace Windu in the episode The Disappeared Part 2. Hu Yang once again references his previous work instructing younglings on how to build their first lightsabers. Ezra rejects a blade emitter the droid hands him because he claims it's too narrow. This might be a joke about a criticism some fans had about Star Wars Rebels, that the lightsaber blades were too thin. Sabine brings up Kanan, and Hu Yang mentions his true name, Caleb, which he changed when he went into hiding after Order 66. The emitter Hu Yang gives to Ezra is the same kind Kanan used in Star Wars Rebels. His new lightsaber now looks like a mix between his master's and his green one that Sabine now wields. When Ahsoka asks Sabine if she's kept up with her training, she at first says she tries, before changing her answer to I do. This is an echo of Yoda's advice to Luke in The Empire Strikes Back. Try not. Do or do not. It's a lesson Kanan also passed on to Ezra. As the Jedi make their way inside the Night Sister Fortress, Thrawn's face flashes with frustration and anger. That happens so rarely in Star Wars Rebels, I think it's worth mentioning. The Great Mothers perform another ritual we've seen before in The Clone Wars, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, and more. They bring several dead night troopers back to life through their dark magic. 
Although these zombies have a different origin than those of the novel Death Troopers, you can't deny the similarities either. Zombie Stormtroopers is something I never thought we would see like this, and I love that it happened just in time for Halloween. The Black Armored Death Troopers also get to live up to their name since they're also zombies. The Rogue One Visual Dictionary actually mentions rumors that they may have some connection to the biological weapon that created the zombie troopers back in Legends. Sabine blasting the lower part of the helmet off the Death Trooper gives it that classic zombie stormtrooper look. This isn't the first time she or Ezra have encountered Night Sister magic. In Star Wars Rebels, Sabine and Kanan were both possessed by the spirits of dead Night Sisters, and Ezra had to save them both. Sabine assisting Ezra in a huge jump is something Kanan and Ezra did several times throughout Star Wars Rebels as well. Ezra pretending to be an Imperial on their own comms is yet another thing he used to do frequently in Rebels. Thrawn taunts Ahsoka with the knowledge that he knew Anakin and knew what he turned into. This is the most direct reference to the events of the book Thrawn Alliances the series has made so far. The convoy Ahsoka sees on Peridia is Morai. She is connected to an immensely powerful being called the Daughter, who sacrificed her life to save Ahsoka during the Clone Wars. Since then, the two have been spiritually connected. The Daughter was one of the Mortis gods alongside the Father and the Son. The statues Balin is seen walking on near the end of the episode are representations of those figures. The Father in the middle, the Son on the right, and what remains of the Daughter on the left. I wouldn't be surprised if the statue of the Daughter was ruined by the Night Sisters because they are more connected with the Dark Side, which was represented by the sun. Off in the distance, Balin sees a flickering light on the top of a mountain. It's possible that could literally be the former home of the Mortis Gods, a mountain stronghold which was seen in the Clone Wars. All this imagery gives us one final callback to Tolkien. The statues are similar to the Argonath that mark the borders of Gondor, and the mountains in the distance are similar to the view Sam and Frodo get of Mordor. Thrawn takes the Great Mothers back to Dathomir, and this is the first time we've seen the planet in live action. It was mentioned in live action by Darth Maul as his base in Solo A Star Wars Story, but has been seen on screen several times in The Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, and Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Ezra's return to the New Republic mirrors the start of this series. He is using Balin and Shin's shuttle, but this time it truly is a Jedi coming on board. Before this series began, we all but knew Hayden would be in it, and we all were guessing how he would appear. Flashback? Force Ghost? Hologram? The fact that we got all three is certainly not an easter egg, but I've gotta point it out, cause it's great. And I also want to point out the many, many musical callbacks the Kiners made to their previous work in The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. Ahsoka's theme, Sabine's theme, and more. Wonderful work. Finally, looking at the credits and knowing the future of this story is likely headed towards Mortis, the blue and gold aesthetic is awfully similar to what we've seen of the mystical realm in the Clone Wars. And that's everything I caught in the entire series. Let me know what I missed in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel for, yes, even more Ahsoka coverage, follow us on our socials, and consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.